So what happens to the core of a high-mass star after the type II supernova event? It really depends on what the core mass is to begin with. And so if the mass of the core of the high-mass star is somewhere between 1.4 and 3 solar masses, then what results after the type II supernova event is a neutron star. If the mass of the core of the star is more than three solar masses, then the most likely object that's left behind after the type II supernova event is a black hole. So neutron stars. These are objects that are the collapsed cores of high mass stars. And so when the iron core collapses down due to gravity, the electrons and the protons of the atoms of this iron actually fuse together to make neutrons. And this tightly packed ball of neutrons is able to hold itself up against gravity. But it's so small that it's minuscule compared to any other object that we've talked about. They are smaller than the Earth, in fact. The typical diameter of a neutron star is only a few miles across, perhaps about the diameter of a large city. And they're so dense, they're much denser than even the white dwarf stars. A cubic centimeter, like a sugar cube, of neutron star matter would have a mass of about 10 to the 11 kilion, uh, kilograms, hundreds of billions of pounds. This would weigh as much as every human on Earth put together. Here's an image that compares the size of a typical neutron star to the size of Manhattan Island. And we can see they're not that unsimilar in, uh, in their length. And so the diameter of a neutron star is much smaller than even the Earth. What does this look like from the outside? The image that you're looking at here is of a supernova remnant. It's called the Crab Nebula. And <clears throat> there is material that has been flung off of the core. This is uh, the outer layers of the star that have exploded into space. And on the inside of the Crab Nebula, there is a neutron star. And we know that because of radio emissions that we get from the neutron star. Pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars that give off radio emission. And these were first observed in the late 1960s by a researcher named Jocelyn Bell. She was using radio telescopes to look at sources of radio light um, that turned on and off, or at least appeared to turn on and off, with uh, very rapid cycles. And so she found one that had a regular period of a little bit more than a second. Today, we know objects like this are rapidly spinning neutron stars that are continuously beaming radio emission out into space. And as they spin, we get a pulse every time they rotate. The image that I'm showing you right now is a uh, uh, depiction of a pulsar or a neutron star that's spinning. A neutron star has an extremely strong magnetic field with a north pole and a south pole, which is typically offset from the rotational axis. And so I'll point to the rotational axis. That's the axis that spins. But the magnetic axis, the north and the south poles of this magnetic field, may point in some other direction. And as this uh, neutron star is spinning so fast, the uh, material that's surrounding the neutron star typically charged particles like protons and neutrons, they get attracted to the magnetic fields. They get spiraled inward towards the poles of the magnetic fields, which cause radiation to be very, uh, uh, very tightly focused in a beam from the poles of this uh, neutron star. If we're out in space and the beam passes by us as the neutron star spins, we observe it as a pulse of radio emission, which is why we call this a, po uh, a pulsar. <clears throat> in this sense, pulsars are like cosmic lighthouses. As a lighthouse on the Earth shines its light out in a beam as, it's, as the uh, light spins around, you only see it every time it passes by you. 
which is similar to what happens with a spinning neutron star. When the beam passes by us, we see it as a pulse of radio emission. Now, black holes are what remains when the core of the most massive stars collapse down during the type II supernova event. What happens is, is that that iron core collapses down to such a small location, in fact, an infinitely small location in space with extremely high density and extremely high gravity. What's left behind cannot be observed directly because any light that might be coming off of it is just directed back inward onto the object. And so the only way that we can observe black holes is if there's material that is swirling or accreting onto the black hole, particularly if it's in a binary system. So that's all a black hole is. It's a collapsed stellar core. It's a place in space that has enormous gravitational attraction, and it's so strong that even light cannot escape. Cannot escape. That's why we call it a black hole. And so here is a black hole. Do you see what I did there? However, in many models, we know that black holes can have companion stars, just like any other star out there. And so if a star is in a binary system, let's say, as in the example I have here, there's a black hole in a binary system with a giant star, the black hole's super strong gravity can pull some of the material off of its companion star into an accretion disk that swirls around the black hole object. As that material swirls around, collisions between the particles make the material superheat so hot that it gives off x-rays. If we can observe these x-rays coming from this material, we can find black holes. And so that's the life of a high mass star after the type II supernova event and what occurs, uh, what types of objects can occur um, uh, during this event. And so high mass stars, once they become a type II supernova, they can either leave behind a neutron star or they can leave behind a black hole.